Hi, I'm Kelly Williams with Futamura Group. I apologize for not being there in person, but uh, some illness not connected to Corona uh, prevented me from, uh, from being, being able to be there in person. So I do apologize for that and also for the technical difficulties of yesterday trying to uh, extend my desktop to present. But uh, let me tell you first, who is Futamura? Futamura is a Japanese-owned company that uh, owns the last remaining assets of the cellophane process, which was the first transparent packaging film used in the world uh, that is happened to be compostable, biodegradable, marine uh, degradable, etc. And NatureFlex is the brand for which we sell those films under. And what I want to talk to you about today is what I call the inconvenient truth about single-use packaging. And if you think about where we're at with single use, you could say Houston we have a problem, but really world we have a problem. And this problem is an ex existential one. I think we all know that. Uh, but what I'm going to discuss today is breaking it down into three areas that's going to tie back to what that, that truth is. So first is population. Uh, second is addiction. And it's not the food that he's eating per se, but uh, you'll see what that is soon and behavior. And when we roll all those together, <clears throat> and I apologize for my voice, I'm uh, battling, uh, having a 17 month old, you realize that you get sick a lot more often than you remember from uh, your older children. So first we have plastics manufacturing. So the world produces 1 million plastic bottles every minute, 500 billion bags per year. We've produced 14 trillion pounds of plastic since 1950, half of that within the last 20 years, of which more than 90% has gone to landfill, escaped into the environment purposely or accidentally, and with a tiny amount incinerated or repurposed. And approximately half of that amount is attributed to single-use packaging. So plastics growth is directly linked to population growth. And the rate of that increase is actually further compounded by the fact that third world countries are now just now accessing packaged consumer goods. So the, the rate of growth of packaged consumer goods is actually faster than the population, but the trend is clearly there. Sadly, the, the amount of packages we use every day, each and every one of those packages will outlive our multiple generations of our family. So it's a temporary item, but it lasts way longer than we do. And we have a population that's exploding and access to, to packaging is growing at, at an even greater rate. So you can kind of see what I mean by that point. Uh, big oil is quickly becoming big plastic. The International Energy Agency predicts that oil demand for plastics will surpass the waning demand for vehicle fuel by 2050. We also have cheap gas from fracking that is certainly not slowing down uh, projects and expansion of plastics production, which is really just uh, only feeding the problem. Next is over-engineered. Packaging is horribly over-engineered, so much so that we've actually developed as an industry the Spanish Inquisition of tests in some cases that in no way represents the real, real world, but we develop these tests simply to be able to demonstrate a difference between one supplier's packaging from another's. So when I work with brands who want to make that, that switch to compostable solutions, the first thing I tell them is they really don't know what they need. They only know what they're currently getting. And if that what they're currently getting involves a two to three year shelf life, then in certain cases they may need to seriously rethink that because we're... It, we're the future is going to a distributive model. So you're going to have more regionalized production. You're not going to have something like a military MRE that's going to have a three to five year shelf life. And let's face it, a bag of chips doesn't need to go to Mars and back and still be fresh. In the end, it's not about what gets collected at the end of the useful life of that chain, but it's what inevitably, inevitably escapes collection or gets rejected from that collection. That, that's the pro actual problem that we're dealing with. 
So we are not addicted to plastics. And I see a lot of headlines saying our plastics addiction. We're not addicted to plastics. What we're addicted to is convenience. Plastics just happen to be the preferred vehicle to deliver that convenience. This leads to this, which then leads to this. When was the last time you were at a, a kid's soccer game and you saw a parent bringing homemade snacks and drinks uh, for after the game? No one does. We do Costco runs. It's far more convenient. So the addiction to convenience is a very important one. And also the untamable capitalism that feeds that addiction is not something that can be easily stopped. In fact, I don't think it ever could be stopped. It can only be uh, curbed, possibly in a different direction. But ultimately, businesses make profits to serve that, that convenience. And being delivered in plastics that will outlive our great-great-grandchildren to only become more dangerous microparticles is a very, very real problem. But don't consider this just a human issue. Uh, all species in our DNA, if our hierarchy of needs are met and we don't have a threat from predators, we're going to take advantage of that convenience. Incidentally, in our home, no food gets wasted. Most of it goes to feeding the outdoor critters in our, in our woods. So yes, our squirrels are about as big as what you see in this picture. Uh, if you haven't ever watched a squirrel eat a three-day-old glazed donut, it's worth every hilarious second. Feeding the convenience has led to some pretty serious aggregate behaviors as the population continues to explode. One being deforestation. So we clear forests for pulp and paper and building products, uh, construction for development, for agriculture, and also to clear more land for meat production, which is the acclaimed cause for the recent Brazil wildfires. We also do it to make things look pretty. In my view, businesses and municipalities need to stop scraping the land for purpose of making it look pretty. The retention ponds with zero trees around is why we have a goose population that's out of control. They have no fear of predators in these cleared settings. Once you scrape the earth, you are officially affecting the natural habitat. So we need to start building upon the old, not scraping out the new. But again, that's a population and behavior problem. Um, did you know that in the U.S., only 20% of the crops that are grown are for human consumption? 67% are for feed. So I found this map from the University of Minnesota researchers, and I wanted to share it because I, I think it's pretty telling and appropriate for a little deviation on the slide here, is that this shows you where food is grown for people versus grown for meat. And what is interesting about this is it takes 100 grain calories to produce only 12 calories of chicken or 3 calories of beef. The prediction is from University of Minnesota is that it will require two additional Indias uh, in order to meet the demand of 9 billion people by mid-century. Next is manufacturing. So we built our modern manufacturing methods back when the question was, can we do it? Versus today where the question should be, should we do it? Uh, this slide is really in itself its own presentation, but the point is our manufacturing methods were never really designed with the outcomes of what we're dealing with today. Then we have too many people driving too many cars stuck in never-ending traffic. Will there ever be a day where you just request a car and it shows up and it takes you where you need to go? Or if you need a truck to haul stuff, you request it and it shows up? Uh, I don't know, but the point is there's a lot of cars on the road and most of them are stuck in traffic. So going back to manufacturing, we have water usage and water contamination. At some point, we have to agree that the solution to pollution isn't dilution. We can't dilute the sins of manufacturing to make it meet quality standards because it all accumulates. So it should give us pause for thought. So what I think is appropriate on this slide is to mention something that I saw uh, 
a year ago at, at Natural Products Expo West. It was from the co-founder of Google X, Tom Chi, who gave a really amazing keynote. And he used a comparison, which I found brilliant. It's a brilliant way to shine the light on things. Humans versus ants. And I don't mean your relative. I mean little ants. So if you weigh all the people on the planet and all the ants on the planet, you would have approximately the same weight, 350 million tons. One stark difference is ants eat three times more food energy than we do. You know, because they have more legs, they work harder, and they're not addicted to convenience. So they, they eat more because they work harder. The difference here is framing the problem. It's not a question of how many people can the planet hold uh, and, and feed, but rather how do they measure up in the, equa in the more appropriate equation, which Tom Chi says is the net ecological service versus ecological demand. And what we can say pretty clearly is that humans would score embarrassingly bad with this equation. We have a far greater demand on the, on the environment than we do a service to the environment. And that's the point. We need to live like ants and we're not living like ants. So now we can get into that inconvenient truth that I was talking about. Um, we have built an out of control apparatus to feed an addiction that is now being impacted by a storm of fear, emotion, concern, logic, illogic, and a whole spectrum of self-interest and motives, motives of uh, self-preservation. So keeping the status quo under false hopes or convenient fallacies, or even what, what I believe is the definition of a fool's errand, is the sustain, quote-unquote, in sustainability, to sustain the current path. Big Plastics funds the Plastics Industry Association, who is intertwined with the American Legislative Exchange, or ALEC, who in turn is a short arm's length with the American Plastic Bag Alliance, who is the entity working the, the ground level to lobby and drive local, state, and federal legislation to quote-unquote ban bans on plastics. Just like I recently experienced in my home state of Ohio where they banned the local municipalities from banning anything, bags, straws, anything. At least in Coral Gables, Florida, a municipality is taking it to the Supreme Court, but I suspect it will not avert this course. Uh, there's too much money in plastics to rethink it all. Instead, we put blind faith that we can eke out a few more generations of sustain and sustainability. Therefore, I've come up with two new acronyms, FIP, which stands for Fortress Incumbent Position, and ERI, which stands for Entangled Relationships and Influence. Big oil slash big plastics has embedded both of these into political and corporate influence to quote-unquote sustain its position under the guise of quote-unquote circularity, for which the only true circularity is to start with nature and end with nature. Yet, at the end of the day, except for some PET applications, it isn't even recycling, it's repurposing. We might even say it's refurbishing. Or maybe perhaps we create a new appropriate term called refurbling. Because MRFs, the material recovery facilities, were never designed to handle flexible plastics. Uh, whether they're compatible with, der with uh, detergent bottles or not, if it doesn't get removed, it contaminates the paper and paperboard stream for which it was designed. So for store take back, that's the only option. If, we, if everyone actually did save all of their flexible packages, even the tiny little pieces that come off when you open it and return it to the stores, stores would have to redesign themselves to accept the enormity of this situation. And let's say this was accomplished. A pouch of beef jerky will never become another package of beef jerky. How many dog toys and park benches can we manufacture to convert the supply of generated waste? Assuming, of course, that consumers are even willing to fully cooperate on a global scale. And it's worth noting that polyolefins, in particular, are destined to waste because they have, at best, three to four thermooxidative passes before they will contaminate the stream from crosslinks and gels. It comes down to, to not being able to collect the uncollectible. The flow is too massive. 
the joules and the grams involved in this, this problem are just too enormous. It's like literally taking a quarter cup of water from Niagara Falls. We cannot even change the wasteful way that we make flexible packaging today, which is 100% controllable by the manufacturing supply chain. We need to stop using an entire windshield of plastic film to, no to do nothing but carry and protect ink. Rather, we should be simplifying functional structures using earth digestible materials and pushing printing from the first step of the process to the last possible step to enable a more lean and flexible supply chain, which is conducive to the changes in market demands anyway, and using overprint protective coatings that simply just didn't exist at the time flexible packaging entered the market. Furthermore, we can't even design today packaging that doesn't require a piece to be torn off from everything from your tamper shrink sleeves on the top of your bottle to the lidding that you have to peel off when you open it to the stand-up pouch you tear the top off a piece comes off to how chips bars and over wraps are open almost all pack all flexible packaging ends up in two pieces so I wanted to put this slide in here because a lot of people ask us questions about landfill well, what happens if compostable package, packaging ends up in a landfill? My point to that is the earth doesn't care. As long as the earth can digest it, it's going to eventually digest it. It's about what doesn't get digested, and it's not about what makes it to the landfill. It's about what escapes the landfill. We should put more emphasis on getting stuff to the landfill. But if we want to break down the landfill, here's your breakdown. And what's interesting is, 50% uh, of the landfill already is compostable between food waste, wood waste, yard waste, and paper and paperboard. So, so capitalism cannot be easily stopped. That's the reality. However, we can allow it to prosper in ways that doesn't zombify our ability to maintain a civilized and integrated global society. It's as simple as that. There would be worldwide toddler-level tantrums if we take away the conveniences that have become commonplace. You don't provide conveniences and then take them away. Worse, it would spark riots to suggest that taking away those conveniences from both the provider side and the receiver side. Even as Ohio is canceling schools statewide for three weeks because of coronavirus, Volunteers are working hard to use these conveniences to ensure kids that depend on those school lunches have food. Therefore, we need a solution that lets everyone have their cake, but the earth can eat it too. Anyone in the food business knows that our brand cannot outsource food safety liability, including hazards that could come from the package. So how long do we have before that burden of the package is treated the same way, meaning you're responsible for not only the safety of the package, but the burden on the planet for that package. Would that change the way we look at packaging? Ultimately, packaging needs to travel with the food waste, the yard waste, the wood and paper products, and be organically recycled to prevent soil erosion. It gets us to the same uh, dismal end of our current path, meaning, uh, I forget the statistic, but there is a like 24 times more plastic microparticles in soil and even in the ocean because of ag films and mulch films and everything else used to support agriculture. If we don't can find more regenerative, truly circular ways to grow food, whether we continue to use that food to feed animals with a lower yield of calories for people, at some point we have to realize that the current path we're on isn't sustainable. It's as simple as that. And truth be told here, we've never needed fossil plastics to do this, to enjoy our creature comforts. Rather, we've grown to enjoy their cheap performance, their incumbency. But even as we circle the drain of our existence, we're looking to find ways to preserve that versus preserving our ability to have it. And I think that that's the problem. We've got to think about what's truly a sustainable path uh, is it trying to find some way to deal with the 
the sins of a short-term package, or do we make that package a natural part of the overall cycle? And if we don't take this seriously, we're going to be experiencing situations far greater than the current COVID-19 uh, coronavirus. Uh, I'm sure most people in the audience right now are not homesteaders. But we're looking at a situation where you're going to have to learn how to homestead to survive. Um, I went to the grocery store last night and the entire paper aisle was completely ripped open. Nothing there. So when people panic... Because they're not homesteaders, they can't make the products that they need to supply to support themselves. They have to rely on packaged consumer goods. So I think this current situation with Corona is case in point that no one's prepared to deal with things on their own. They have to have packaged consumer goods. And that's the problem because those packaged consumer goods provide an increasing burden on the planet that we think we can collect it where we can't. There's not a shop shop back big enough that can siphon up all these little packages and all these little pieces that tear off of every package to be able to siphon it and get it to a place to ultimately do what with it? Make more park benches and deck boards? Dog frisbees? We're not going to recycle it back into actually making that package again. And even if we could, collection continues to be the evasive part of it. I like to, to use the term Rather than chasing solutions to a problem, what we're doing is we're chasing solutions to the symptoms of a problem. And unfortunately, we're going to be in for a, a rude awakening soon enough because if we don't do something, the oceans are going to acidify, climate's going to continue to destabilize, which only adds more wobble to the already situational chaos. That is completely in our control. So you got to think about what's, what's the, the true path as a brand needs to take to, to do that. If that answer is to consolidate plastics to fewer plastics that still will outlive our great-great-grandchildren, and we hope that 7.8 billion people in growing continue to cooperate, or not continue, will cooperate with taking it somewhere to be reused, or do we start making packaging, packaged consumer goods out of available earth benign materials? So when you look outside and you see trees and, and grass and, and bushes, nature is building for us every day fully refined, suitable polymers and chemicals to react and do things with, to make everything that we need, most everything we need. There will always be a need for plastics, but not for single-use packaging. Nature already makes what we need. We have just, to date, done a lousy job getting it out and using it, but now even though there's a lot of activity in that space, there's more resistance to doing that because there's so much vested interest in the current path that we want to put all of our focus on finding some way to deal with the downstream sins of it versus rethinking it. And rethinking it means going back to where it started and how we made packaging in the beginning and rethinking the, the materials, how and when it's printed, how to make it relevant to today's more personalized, demanding consumer and doing it in a way that's in a distributive model that can end up where it needs to be, which is at a, a regional, one of the 4,700 plus composting centers. And even if it doesn't end up in a composting center, it's still earth digestible, meaning it's a package that's made out of materials that are by design a food source for the earth's microorganisms. So shy of glaciers in the desert, eventually microorganisms will eat it. It's where it started, it's where it needs to go, and that's why it's I call this the title of this talk The Inconvenient Truth About Single-Use Packaging. Look, I was part of that process. I helped design coax structures that would make a package of beef jerky last three years, or a bag of chips that can go to Mars and back and still be fresh. I was part of that problem. We all knew that deep, dark secret that you can't do anything with it afterward, but the benefits of flexible packaging were so prudently and still to this day, still so overwhelmingly positive versus rigid packaging that you still have to have flexible packaging. In fact, you can't sustain 9 billion people without flexible packaging. 
But if that packaging poisons the very soil for which you grow the food that you eat or feed the animals for which you eat, we will be homesteading if we don't do something about it today. So with that, that's my presentation. Hopefully you found it insightful, maybe a bit provocative, but I think it's a message that needs to be said uh, because there isn't the organization around uh, earth digestible packaging like the plastics industry. And anyone that wants to find out the source of my data, the things that I said, or reach out to me in general, that's the way that you can contact me. And I apologize for not having a voice, but uh, I got the same cold for the third time in, in uh, four months from my lovely 17-month-old son. So I do apologize. Sorry I'm not there in person. Hopefully you found this um, an interesting talk and look forward to hearing from you. Thanks.